Thank you so much. What a great honor to be here as uh, your American on stage here. And what a great act to follow. Wow, all those women. I hope to work for one of you one day. Thank you for your hard work and your success. Okay, so let's see if I can get my slides started here. Doesn't see, there we go. Okay, I've prepared uh, about 20 minutes of materials for you and it starts here in 2012. <laughs> is the uh, bioeconomy strategy from Europe. The National Bioeconomy Blueprint on the right is the document I wrote when I was at the White House and under President Obama's first term. You'll notice they have a couple things in common. One thing is they both have about five, five objectives uh, for, for change. I wanna point out what they don't have in common. If you look at the bottom on the right, under public-private partnerships, specifically called out here in the um, National Bioeconomy Blueprint, uh, we felt that that was, I guess, more important at the time than issues relating to sustainability. Our strategy didn't mention sustainability one time, oddly enough. Well, uh, what happened after 2012? Uh, there were a bunch of things that happened. There we go. And one of the things, very important thing, was the US recognized biological innovation as an economic driver. We were very quick in 2012 to define bioeconomy as economic activity, specifically measurable part of our economy that is a, a result of bioinnovation. Many things happened after 2012. In 2015, Jim Philp mentioned the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. That is a non-government organization started by Abraham Lincoln in the 1860s in the US to serve as advisory body to the US government. And they came out with an, a very important point, um, report called Industrialization of Biology. That was followed in 2016 by the billion ton report that said the US government has, oh, the, US, uh, the US itself has a billion tons of sustainable biomass that could be strategically converted into economic value. In 2017, the uh, National Academies again came out with of uh, preparing for future products of biotechnology. This focuses specifically on the US regulatory system, which was notably, still is, unprepared for complex novel future products of biotechnology. What will our government do with a genetically engineered consortium of microbes that can supplant synthetic nitrogen as a soil amendment? What will we do with that? This report intended to uh, approach that problem. In 2020 was a big year after a little bit of a gap, and I'll talk more about this report from the National Academies safeguarding the bioeconomy in just a minute. The, uh, the big news that year was a report from McKinsey, uh, McKinsey Consultancy that came out and said the, econ the bioeconomy could be $4 trillion, and it could be due to 60% of the manufacturing inputs being grown as agricultural inputs. In 2020, also in January of that year, same, same month this report came out, the Department of Energy pulled together all of its assets for biomanufacturing in a strategic innovation X lab and showed companies that with, there were opportunities for them to partner in public-private partnerships, including the very first open public biofoundry. In 2021, the Congressional Research Service, the research arm of US Congress, put out a report called The Bioeconomy, a Primer, with several policy options for Congress to consider, far beyond research and development. This was, uh, for me, uh, quite, a, quite an accomplishment and a landmark event. Here, we don't have a BIC equivalent, which we're gonna talk a little bit about, I hope, uh, but the closest thing that we have, BIO, the Biotechnology Innovation uh, Organization, put out a first ever report, Biotechnology Solutions for Climate. This really did turn the tide. Many Americans only think of biotech as delivering biomedical solutions, so this was an important step for us. But maybe the biggest of all in 2022 was the Boston Consulting Group who said four trillion, no, this is 30 trillion. This could be a 30 trillion opportunity if we get this right. I mentioned the 2020 National Academies report, Safeguarding the Bioeconomy. This report was interesting in it's the very first time anyone actually tried to measure the US bioeconomy, and it was a very difficult task. It rings in at about, uh, nine, about a trillion, uh, 
trillion dollars of uh, direct and indirect spillover economic activities and includes things that are very hard to measure, such as intangible assets like data sets. Data sets are bought and sold and how much of our US bioeconomy has to do with DNA-based data sets. So the report also did a couple of things. Eight years after the bioeconomy blueprint was published, federal government, you need to coordinate better. There is no one home for the, the actual bioeconomy in the US. We need to measure better. This study was extremely hard to do and uh, probably very incomplete in 2016 numbers uh, being um, calculated in 2020. And let's drive new markets with bio-based procurement. In the United States, we have something called the Farm Bill. And the Farm Bill mandates that government agencies and contractors have to buy bio-based products but they don't really have to be held accountable to that. And so this report says, let's make that uh, a requirement. And train the next generation bioeconomy workforce. This was also uh, a recommendation of the National Bioeconomy Blueprint. And of course, as was this one, clarify those regulatory pathways that are inhibitions to the bioeconomy. In 2022, 10 years after the publication of the National Bioeconomy Blueprint, uh, the executive order aforementioned, uh, 14081, was established and created the first ever national bioeconomy initiative in the U.S. And I like that uh, Christian mentioned sustainable, safe, and secure American bioeconomy. There is a lot buried in those words. So what is this bioeconomy and biomanufacturing R&D thing about? It's about climate change solutions. The Department of Energy is on the hook for that. It's about agricultural innovation. The US Department of Agriculture has that responsibility. Supply chain resilience through bio. This is the first time. This is the Department of Commerce has to be on the hook for that. Human health, of course, that's where most, most of the money goes. And that is uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. And enhancing biosafety and biosecurity, a brand new initiative was born that that follows on the uh, stated goals of this bioeconomy executive order. There are many, many, there are nine. Grow domestic biomanufacturing capacity. Expand market opportunities for bio-based products. Does that sound familiar? This is the third time. <laughs> and uh, drive R&D for major societal challenges. This is the first time we have societal in there, so that's an advance. Improve access to quality federal data. We spend a lot of money creating data, and yet there's not a great way to make it accessible, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. Those, those are the fair data principles in the US. Train and support a diverse, skilled bioeconomy workforce. Heard that one before, too. Streamline regulations for products of biotechnology. Yep, that one's been heard before. Advance biosafety and biosecurity innovation to reduce risk to the bioeconomy. What does that mean? It means a lot of different things. One of the things it means is that it was recognized that automation is vulnerable to hacking. And as more and more of our biomanufacturing becomes fully automated, including, by the way, agriculture, it becomes a target for hacking. And that can ruin an entire harvest. Agriculture is the basis of the bioeconomy, so you understand better than most people what that could mean. Promote standards, establish metrics, and develop systems to grow and assess the bioeconomy. It's that measurement thing again. Let's do it better. And then build a, a thriving, secure global bioeconomy with partners and allies, like found here today. So the ad executive order said there are going to be many reports that the agencies are going to have to produce, and several of them are done. They're out. And importantly, the green one here is how to measure the U.S. bioeconomy better. This comes from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. We're going to talk a little bit about those bold goals for uh, biomanufacturing and biotechnology. This is the R&D bold goals um, effort from the U.S. And the White House also re re uh, released in June, building the bio workforce of the future. So we're making some progress here. Very specific agencies in charge of leading coalitions of agencies to actually make a difference here. But some of these, it, these are late. We're still waiting to see infrastructure. We're still waiting to see data. We're still waiting to see regulatory reform. Okay, the bold goals were released in March of this year. And you can see here at the Advanced Bioeconomy Leadership Council 2023 meeting in March, this whole panoply of US officials sitting on stage for the very first time 
talking in unison about the U.S. bioeconomy. In 2012, when we released the bioeconomy, I had to remind one of the secretaries in the, in the green room what the word bioeconomy meant. And here, we now have hundreds and hundreds of people that have spent all of their time working on this executive order. And I will offer, um, I think it was Rob who mentioned earlier, that uh, changing administrations are, of course, part of life. The Obama administration with the National Bioeconomy Blueprint, but it was the Trump administration that started the executive order that didn't quite make it over the finish line. So, and the Biden administration did. So this is, a, if you will, a bipartisan, a red plus blue plus purple uh, kind of effort in the US to grow jobs. So what are these um, bold goals? Well, they are pretty bold. And um, I will say, uh, there are a lot of people around the world watching to see if these are gonna be um, in any way uh, achieved. Climate, in 20 years, employ cost-effective and sustainable routes to convert bio-based feedstocks into recyclable polymers to displace 80% of existing plastics. 90% of existing plastics. That's on the Department of Energy. Food and agriculture, by 2030, reduce methane from agriculture by 30%. Supply chain, in 20 years, produce at least 30% of U.S. chemical demand via sustainable and cost-effective biomanufacturing pathways. That's ambitious. Health, in 20 years, increase manufacturing scale of cell-based therapies and decrease costs as well as decreasing health inequities. The cross-cutting one here, um, I think it was Maria who mentioned, uh, we need to have a better understanding of the genomic potential that feeds the bioeconomy. In five years, sequence the genomes of one million microbial species to understand fun and understand the function of 80% of those newly discovered genes, many of those enzymes that do the hard work of creating the stuff that biological complexity brings. So, uh, people, the media recognize these bold goals, people around the world recognize these bold goals, and they are indeed very bold indeed. In 2021, I was asked to take a leave of absence from where I was for 10 years, and in the, at that time, I was very discouraged by the lack of progress by the United States. And two um, billionaire philanthropists, Eric and Wendy Schmidt had uh, created one of their philanthropic initiatives called Schmidt Futures. And Eric Schmidt, he's the former CEO of Google, he loves platform technologies and he sees DNA as a platform technology because it's programmable. In the case of Wendy Schmidt, she has a long philanthropic career around circular economies, including partnering up with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So these two visionaries uh, gave me an opportunity to try to create something exciting and different in 2021. And I did this with a very talented uh, earlier career scientist named uh, Andrea Hodgson. Dr. Hodgson came from the National Academy. She was the study director on safeguarding the bioeconomy and was a program officer on the Preparing for Future Products of Biotechnology report. We put together a task force of dimension, dim uh, diversity in all of its dimensions, career stage, gender, ethnicity, former government regulators of biotechnology, venture capitalists, academic researchers, industry researchers from small companies, big companies, and we asked them to help us come together with a group of recommendations that would be ripe for philanthropy. Philanthropy can do things that governments and industry can't do sometimes, and so we asked them to come together and give us some help. And here is a result of that six-month effort. This is a, a report that you can download at this QR code. I actually carried a couple of copies with me across the ocean in case anybody wants one. Please take them off my hands because they're heavy. The U.S. bioeconomy charting a course for a resilient and competitive future. Why would anyone trust somebody at two people at a philanthropic organization to write a national scale strategy? Because nothing was moving. And because so many voices, not just those 30 people that you saw, we did 160 interviews with current government people, current regulators, and asked, what do you need? What do you want to see? A current company, um, venture capitalists, everything we could think of to try to move the needle on this. And this report is, as I say, a play in three acts. We wrote Act one and act three in lay people language so that policymakers could understand it. And what I mean by that is the justification and the recommendations are written in plain English. And the case studies, act three, 
bring home those real challenges with regulatory problems as well as other opportunities. The section in the middle is a highly technical strategy that we wrote in the exact format that the federal government uses to write their own strategies so that they could just pick up section 4.1.2 and decide to go implement that if they wanted to. So this report has recommendations for industry, for uh, philanthropists, for um, governments, state, local, you name it. So our program was born, our biofutures program was born after this report. They, they looked at the work that we did and said, okay, here you go. What are you gonna do if we give you some money? And we said within five years, we're gonna catalyze a future for a vibrant, competitive, resilient, circular bioeconomy in the US. Now this came out well before the, the um, executive order came out. But what I'll say is I've spent my time in the last 11 years watching the Europeans do circular things that we couldn't even talk about in the United States. And so that's why we came up with this. And there are basically five pillars here, expanding research, of course, fostering a national ecosystem of innovation and commercialization for the bioeconomy, build a national infrastructure, for goodness sakes, develop a diverse workforce, you've heard that before, and enable policy that incentivizes and supports a circular bioeconomy. When the executive order came out several months after this, it didn't mention circular one time. When the bold goals came out, you may have noticed they, rec they mentioned circular 14 times. So progress is being made, even from a little tiny engine that could, which is a philanthropic organization. Okay, so what have we been doing? In the last couple of minutes, I wanna ex explain where have we put some money and why did we do it? So you'll see those five pillars across the top. The one in the middle that doesn't have anything under it, building a national infrastructure. That's probably not really for philanthropic dollars. Philanthropic dollars are traditionally very catalytic. There's about science philanthropy estimates, say $2 billion annually, and most of that goes to translational medicine in um, uh, biomedicine, translational research in biomedicine. So what are we doing? What, whoops, what we just did is we just started uh, an effort that we hope will get funded on a regulatory fellows program exploration. What is the regulatory science that would be needed to enable a government agency to look at that microbial consortium in soil and say, yeah, there's no horizontal gene transfer here, it's safe, or this is the persistence in soil, or you need a kill switch, and blah, blah. So can we get these fellows, can we get a program off the ground to, to deliver those kinds of risk assessment pathway data set requirements? Maybe, maybe not. Global metrics. We uh, made an award late last year to a team um, out of the UK to pull together a global community of convenings to find out are there standards and metrics for the global bioeconomies that make sense to collate, to, to, to crystallize and to, to um, advance. And so the first one was in, the first convening was in the, um, the Americas, second in Asia, and the third just two weeks ago here in Brussels. I don't know what the answer is going to be. I didn't actually attend any of those workshops. It's great when you have people who can go do all those things for you. And so hopefully by the end of the year, we'll see, are there standards and metrics that make sense? And if so, what kind? Data standards? Data standards for human genome data standards? Microbial standards? Uh, downstream processing standards? Who knows? But there's a lot of industry voices coming together here to say, don't bring any standards forward unless they actually have value. So are there ones that have value? Let's see. All right, uh, Biomanufacturing Successes and Challenges Workshop. We funded a workshop at the National Academies to say internationally, what has been learned that we can learn from so we don't have to uh, recreate the wheel, make the same mistakes, et cetera. And a couple of you here in this room participated in that, and thank you very much for that. I would say that's been a great success. There is a proceedings in brief that is available online, as well as a couple other um, webinars that have been springing up as more and more people keep saying, we wanna learn more about the workforce, we wanna learn more about the uh, international lessons. Workforce expansion. In the U.S., it's not uh, uncommon for biotechnology to be a career of choice for people on the West Coast and on the East Coast. That's where the universities are. That's where the, the real um, engines of startups have been historically. And so uh, it's typical for that workforce to be uh, coming from the, the coasts. However, there's a lot of people in the middle of the country that are being left behind who don't know what biotechnology is, who don't know what biomanufacturing is, and don't need a PhD and can do two-year certificates to actually come forward and have valuable great careers as 
as distributed biomanufacturing gains traction across the United States. We uh, funded uh, an, a, a pilot program to see if a successful underrepresented minority effort in biotechnology can be expanded. And so we're very excited about seeing the results of that. Okay, something called Bio P2P Network. Uh, this is our answer to Europe's BioPilots for You. BioPilots for You is amazing. It has this interface where you can very quickly see from all over the world what is the inventory of available assets, pilot scale assets for Europe or anyone else. And by the way, a lot of Americans use this because we don't have anything in the US that's like this. We don't know where our pilot scale things are as, as a compilation. If you're a consultant, you know where it is and you charge people a lot of money to tell them where that is. But now we're making it public. So um, we're not quite done yet. This is open. On online and beta uh, testing right now, and people seem to be uh, flocking to it in different ways, both uh, providers and uh, people who want to find places. So we think this could be a success, we'll see. Bioreactor innovation. We par so my first job in 1998 in the Cenozoic era of micro, uh, meta you know, metabolic engineering, we, uh, we knew that we had a lot of uh, legacy challenges with uh, bioreactors and not a whole lot has changed, I've found. And so um, we listened to a bunch of brave industry people who were willing to say, if you folks would put some money together, because we can't get venture capital to back it and we can't get the federal government to back it, maybe we can actually do some bioreactor innovation. We partnered up with uh, a new public-private par partnership called Biomade. That's a Department of Defense effort, a manufacturing uh, an institute of innovation, and we now have made uh, five teams uh, awards, and they are off and running with a to total of 24 months to produce some innovation. We just uh, got an approval for a biosensor innovation effort. This is a smaller scale, more pilotish, even so, looking for intracellular biosensors who can, that can give us a better picture of what's happening inside bioreactors, the heterogeneity inside, when do, when do we see early signs of contamination, when do we see early signs of crashes. Uh, we'll see whether this can actually get off the ground, but I think it's, it's one of those things that we've heard in our task force is sorely needed. Lastly, the thing we are very excited about, this is our largest and flagship effort, $42 million on our part is um, brought together with co-funding from a partner we just announced last, uh, last month. We are looking to turn the carbon we have into the carbon we want and the carbon we need. And what I mean by that is in the US, in the Pacific Northwest, I happen to live in California where there's lots of fires, forest management gives rise to a bunch of woody, cellular, woody biomass that has nowhere to go but to be burned. It's expensive to move and, uh, it's, it's, it, and it just goes into the atmosphere when it gets burned. Can we actually figure out a way to turn feedstocks like that? Also in California, walnut shells, uh, almond shells, most of the almonds around the world come from California. And so what do we do with all that biomass after we harvest? We burn them. So uh, we are looking to innovators to pivot to taking that carbon biomass at regional scales, right, big experiment, to see whether or not we can also get co-development of uh, strains that are optimized to eat that carbon and maybe um, make a dent in the circular bioeconomy problem that the U.S. Um, doesn't seem to be putting any money really into yet. And with that, uh, I'll just say that it was very exciting when that report came out, the executive order came out in September of 2022. This was the headline, biotechnology gets $2 billion boost from the White House. Well, that was existing money that was already programmed for that. So it, it remains to be seen whether those bold goals will actually have significant funding to follow them so that we can actually make a difference here. So I bring to you the goals and a big aspiration and wish that they are achieved. So not only was 2020, 2012, 2012 was the landmark year, 2022 was a landmark year, and I understand 2023 is also a landmark year from the birthday uh, of BIC, uh, something the U.S. chose not to do or decided not to do, and I think um, it's very clear that BIC has been a success and we have a lot to learn. And with that, I say thank you again for your time.